I'm Samar, <laughs> and I um, am a teacher in Greenwich, a uh, primary school teacher at Henwick Primary. Ooh. And um, I was teaching in Boston previously, and I'm so excited to be facilitating this meeting with you guys. Um, just watching those videos, I've been watching those videos for the last, like when the strike started, like crying in my kitchen, um, <laughs> because it's just been so exciting. Um, what's been going on. I just want to say thank you to everyone who came despite football being today. <laughs> um, not only did we not expect West Virginia to lead the American teachers movement this year, we did not expect England to do well. <laughs> um, so these, these things happen. These things happen. Stop believing. Yeah, we believe in West Virginia teachers. We believe in England. Um, yeah, endless. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just, so the, uh, um, I just, I wanted to just say that, start by saying that the West Virginia Wildcat strike is one of the most important, significant uh, labor victories in the U.S. Not only because it was across the entire state, but because it was illegal, it went Wildcat, and it won. And I think under the Trump administration, and as we can say here under the May administration, that is a huge victory. I don't think people thought you would take on your Republican state governors the way that you did and succeed, and it was inspiring. And it spread, which was the most exciting thing, to other states across the U.S. And um, it, it's, it's inspired teachers internationally which has been really excited. And we in, in the UK have been extremely inspired watching you guys. Um, as you know, we were going through the um, UCU strike, the uh, college professors and staff were going on their strike at the same time. Um, so it was very inspiring times. Um, and that's actually why we decided to bring you. Uh, because right now in Greenwich, the John Roan School uh, secondary schools on strike um, against academization, which is a big deal, and we are closely watching the John Roan School to set an example for other schools in the country. So we're watching you guys just as we were watching you, um, and uh, we're just really excited to have you. And and you know, please share. We're we're excited for the lessons that we can learn from you guys. So. Without further ado, I am going to introduce Sarah Duncan, who is a local activist um, in Roan County, West Virginia. She's a K-8 art school teacher and previously the president of the Mingo County um, thank you, Teachers Association. Um, and Jay O'Neill, who is a teacher in Kanawha. And because I've seen you talk on so many um, YouTube videos, I already know you're a middle school teacher, being the hard one. <laughs> and um, he was also the starter of the Facebook group. And um, I couldn't find any other dirt on you, unfortunately. That's good. It was all clean. Um, but yeah, let me. He doesn't snore either. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, so I'll pass it on to them. He's Thank a you guys. Walker. <laughs> And we'll, we'll, um, so we'll let Sarah and Jay speak and then we'll have intimate conversation with them over beer and wine and football. <laughs> so do you know, do you want to go first, Sarah? Um, yeah, I'll start off. Um, I think it's important to sort of lay out some of the challenges that West Virginia has in general because all of those things affect our schools. So um, a lot of people don't know a whole lot about West Virginia. They've lumped it in with Virginia for a long time, but West Virginia is the part of the state that went with the North that Virginia didn't really want. And, um, I mean, there's reasons for that. It's, it's difficult as far as accessibility. We have a lot of mountains. It's expensive to build roads. It's just not as accessible there in Appalachia as a lot of other places. And because of that, it's um, isolated in some ways. So you've got a lot of poverty in West Virginia. Um, we have a history of, of coal mining, especially in the South, and that has really died out and left a lot of people without work. Um, we have issues with generational poverty. Um, we have issues, we have ridiculously high levels of obesity, um, cancer, just a lot of different health care issues. Um, partially because of the poverty and the lifestyle, 
Um, a lot of places in West Virginia are food deserts, which means there are not grocery stores that are easily accessible. All of Mingo County has one grocery store. Yes, the whole county. So <laughs> you you're either go to that grocery store in Southern Gilbert near McDowell County. If you've never looked or searched up McDowell County, check that out. That's really depressing. But um, you'd have to go to a Walmart over in Kentucky, or you'd have to um, go to a gas station or a fast food place or something like that. So nutrition is a, is a problem. Um, Health care is a problem, like I said, not just because of the poor health, but because it's difficult to get doctors there. Um, a lot of times, children have not received the early child sort of health care that they need. Adults often don't go in and get the health care that they need. Um, and more recently, the opioid epidemic has absolutely ravaged our state. Every family in that state is affected somehow or has a friend. And, and yeah. in the southern part and some of the poorer parts, especially near Kentucky, Virginia, and that whole area, it's, it's absolutely pervasive. And it has contributed to a problem with foster care. We, West Virginia actually might be sued by our national government because of how poorly they're dealing with the foster care situation. We have children that have been taken out of their homes and they don't have a place to put them. I mean, they will let just about anyone be a foster parent, which is really scary. Um, but I lay all of that out because the schools take that on. I mean, if there's no one else who's gonna step up, and it's your teachers and your service personnel and, and anyone who works in it, the, the kids come to the school to learn, but they also come to your school to be safe, and they come there to be fed, and they come there to have their health care taken care of and everything else. A lot of our teachers are foster parents. Um, they're poorly paid. They don't get the respect that I think that they should have. Um, their insurance is eroding. And lots of other little things every year. They try and take away seniority. They try and union bus. They try and do all these things, and it's just constant. So what happened this year didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, it's been building slowly and burning, but there were definitely sparks, and I'll let you lead into that. Yeah, um, another unfortunate thing about West Virginia is it's, I mean, I would call it like a weak union state. We don't have collective bargaining. Um, and so, and we have two, two main teachers unions. Um, I'm in one and Sarah's in the other. And um, we also have a service personnel union. And you would love to think that all these like work together so well and fight for the common good, <laughs> but it's mainly like they just try to recruit against each other. And they spend so much of their resources trying um, to do that, even though you can see we have much bigger problems that we probably should be tackling. And so um, this past fall, she mentioned a Facebook group. I just started a Facebook group called West Virginia Teachers United, mostly out of frustration and just thinking, I know people like Sarah. Sarah's great. Sarah wants to work for things I don't want to work for. Just because she's not in my union doesn't mean we can't like work together to achieve the common cause. So starting to do that. Um, but the thing that really kicked off the strike and the bigger issue is our health insurance. Um, it, it's called PEIA, and I'll just it's Public Employees Insurance Agency, but we'll probably refer to it again. Um, and it, it's the same story you're seeing all over the states, right? You, you give tax cuts to corporations. So you have less money coming in, and then who bears the brunt of it, right? Public employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so basically they just weren't funding it like they needed to. Health care costs are going up, and it's just cut after cut after cut. And every year they'd roll out a new plan and present it to us and have these public hearings, and teachers and other public employees would get up there and tell soft stories about how much more it's going to be, and their, their medication costs are going up, that they're monthly costs are going up, their cost to visit their doctor are going up, all our salaries aren't, but nothing would change. We'd be encouraged to talk to our legislators, yeah. you know, call, email, meet with them, nothing changes. So this past fall, it was particularly bad because basically they were going to take something they called total family income. So for instance, my spouse is covered under my insurance, but she doesn't work for public school, she works for something else. So they're going to say, okay, so since she's on it, 
we're not going to just look at how much you make to determine how much you pay for insurance. We're going to like take hers into it as well. Okay, and we're going to use that to determine your premium. So our costs would have doubled easily. Um, they also had this crazy thing called Go365. It was a wellness program that just really invasive and really, um, instead of reward, because West Virginia is unhealthy, but instead of rewarding people um, for doing healthy lifestyle things, it was going to penalize you if you didn't. Um, so they wanted you to join a gym and like log in and track that, which is not that great in a state like West Virginia that's really rural, or get a Fitbit so they could track your steps. They wanted you to upload all this mental health like information, just really personal stuff that it was we're not liking. Yeah, so you had all that happening, and we got the sense that people were angrier this year than before. Um, so we kind of changed that Facebook group because there was like 50 people in it anyway. It wasn't doing much to Public Employees United and really started trying to recruit people and get in contact with people and just, early it was just trying to maybe stop a few of these changes to the health insurance and make it a little bit better. Um, but things just picked up. We kind of had a goal of, okay, by, by January 1st, let's get a thousand members. And we were able to do that and we were really thrilled. Great, we have a lot of people that are angry about this and they're talking to each other. That's, that's new, that's big, but you know what now? And um, we were just talking about this before. On January 6th, somebody said, what was it like, when are when we going to strike? When are we going to strike about this? And suddenly you saw the group that was eh, kind of active just skyrocketed activity. And it was, it was clear, it was like one of those things that had kind of been on people's mind and they were that frustrated, but they had never actually said it you know, to a bigger group of people. And so that's kind of when activity picked up, I would say. Well, and I felt like, too, at that point, um, the people that were being added to this group were not just union members. They weren't from just one union. They were teachers, service personnel, state employees, people that weren't in anything at all. And suddenly, all these people that I think had either been disengaged or inactive, and we didn't have a lot of activism. I mean, we had some people who were very active, but on the whole, we did not have a lot of activism. But it was easily accessible. And all these people living in far out places in West Virginia still have a cell phone. You know, they still, a lot of them have some Wi-Fi and can get on Facebook and rant, rant, rant and rave like we do on Facebook. And so, you know, that question pops up and everybody starts adding everybody they know that is in any way related to education and it just explodes to wow. 25 thousand members or something very quickly. Yeah, and in, and in beginning of January we had a thousand, and by the end of the month we had over 20,000. Like, it was just absolutely bonkers. And <laughs> it was insane for a while. Like, trying to read that page, like, your head <laughs> Every minute. explode. Because you have all these people that really don't know. I mean, they don't know what's going on with their insurance, and they're very angry, and there's true information and misinformation and just a mess, but a good mess, because people care enough, at least, that they're engaging. Um, so it gets to, you know, it's in January, and, and some of us um, are starting to talk to our legislators a little bit, but people are not just disengaged with the unions, they're also disengaged with their representatives in office, and a lot of people don't even know who they are. So um, we really had an awakening in that way, and... Um, I felt like I felt like the actions of the legislators really helped us. Yeah. They were rude and they were disrespectful. <laughs> they acted like they didn't care and it just absolutely fanned the flames. People would <laughs> screenshot responses they'd get from legislators and it was kind of unbelievable. I mean, you'd almost think it was a joke just how little they seemed to care mm -hmm. for things. So that would get shared. People would make memes of things like that and it really kind of built on each other mm -hmm. um, throughout the process. Well, and I think the legislators are used to people not paying attention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They felt like they could say or do whatever they wanted. Yeah. And, you know, um, they could in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but what became really interesting, too, is we kept saying, and most people's big issue was PEIA. Pay is also obviously an issue. That $48,000 number, I'm not even sure that's accurate. But yeah. I will say, we have an aging workforce, too. So that is not very representative of what most people make. Um, a, a beginning teacher in West Virginia, before the, the pay raise that we achieved, made almost about $32,000.
with a bachelor's degree. What does that mean? We'll look it up. You know, I remember out of that too, that's before you take out for your insurance right. and your union dues and Student all your taxes and, and yeah. you're left with very little. And the increment that you get on that is about $500 a year. Wow. So your insurance costs are raising uh, more than that it, yeah. every year. So you're just being completely outpaced and you have to have a car in West Virginia. You have to drive to work. You have to pay for gas. I mean, there's just a lot of expenses in a place like that that are unavoidable. So it was just becoming completely unsustainable. It was bad, but it was becoming impossible. And, you know, our governor comes up there and he's like, okay, you know, we're, we're hearing you guys. We'll give you a 1% raise. <laughs> and then it just exploded and then it was on like that did it that was just it was insulting like it would have been better if he had said nothing so um it's it's hard almost to go back and look like i wish i had documented and taken pictures there were so many things happening in so many different places in the state you know and people want to know how did you organize this and we tried but a lot of it was disorganized chaos. But you're trying to direct that force in the right direction, you know? Like, and I, I said this earlier today, we couldn't even decide what color shirt to wear. Like, that's, that's, that's not the only color. Like, a lot of our bus drivers were wearing yellow, and some people were like, no, we should be wearing purple for all state employees. You have this whole group of purple shirt wearing people. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous, but, um, <laughs> One thing we did early on is we said we're not just going to advocate for teachers, we're going to advocate for service personnel, and we are going to, and very quickly we started advocating for state employees also. Because they tried to use those differences in our employment to divide us. And they were almost successful at times. There were times when I was afraid it was going to work. Because there are deep divides between teachers and service personnel in the past, you know. There's a little bit of distrust. Um, one feels like one feels like the other is not really going to advocate fairly or as strongly, you know. So, you know, they would offer the teachers a two percent raise this year and one percent the next year, and then they would say, "Service personnel, you just get two percent," you know. And it was that kind of stuff constantly. And then they said, "Well, you know, teachers, you're better off than a lot of other West Virginia citizens. You know, this state's struggling and." There are other state employees that, that haven't had pay raises in over a decade, you know. And we said, fine, then everyone needs one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we started yeah. advocating. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and there was there was disagreement about that. Some people felt like, well, the state employees aren't really participating on the level we should, maybe we shouldn't include them, but you know, that's how you put that hand out, you know, enable them to start advocating like give them an avenue because they don't have the same unions that we have I mean it's easy to sit here and complain about unions and all the things they should have done or haven't done but they've not had this level of activism to deal with ever I mean they've told us we we went from so little activism and then thousands of people are showing up like what do we do with you guys like our national union people didn't know what That's to true. do with us yeah. and I do feel like I felt like in the end they didn't have confidence. I think they thought we were just talking strike, like didn't mean it, didn't take it seriously, and kind of tried to calm us down a little bit because we did not have a friendly legislature. They knew that. They were afraid of what would happen to us. Um, but I think we like we realize you you look at the odd, like you look at the the whole situation, right? There were over 720 unfilled vacancies in West Virginia for teachers. So even though we knew it was illegal to strike, you start thinking like, He's really? Gonna break it. Yeah, well you gonna, <laughs> yeah. right, or are you, you really gonna yeah. fire us if we do this? Like, <laughs> what are you gonna do then? Are you gonna arrest 20,000 people? Right, yeah. and so you kind of got that, and it was so crucial to have service personnel on board because I think in some of the first counties that went out, they were really crucial because they would say, well, sorry, we have superintendents who's kind of over whole county school system they'd say sorry superintendent but the buses aren't running like you can have school if you want but there'll be no kids there because yeah. <laughs> it's not happening because it's a rural state like you kids don't come to school unless there's a school bus and so they were really 
crucial in that. And so, yeah, I agree. It was nice to kind of be broader than just teachers and kind of include everyone. Um, the, what really kicked it off, it went from just talk, are we striking, no strike, shh, 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 just talk, 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 to actually like was four counties in the southern part of the state, which is, you know, if you've seen the movie Mate One, that was yeah. one, Mingo County was one of the counties that started it, and just kind of that historic coal area part of the state, they kind of had a meeting and said, let's walk out. Like, yeah, we're fed up, we're walking out. We're calling it Fed Up Friday and we're walking out. <laughs> and they did, you know, rumors started percolating in the Facebook group because none of us were really sure, and of course they were trying to keep it hush hush but that day it, I'll never forget it like that day it happened my county was not one of those yet so I'm still in school and you know <laughs> looking at the Facebook group because all these people are doing live feeds on uh, from their phone and during my planning and at lunch watching it it was just amazing to see hundreds if not thousands of teachers didn't go to work that day and are flooding our capital and letting our legislators like have it you know just signs, chants, everything. And I think that point was like, the genie was out of the bottle. There was no going back. Other teachers had seen it. They wanted to be part of that. And that's when things got moving. And that's when our unions started working together, um, which was really kind of another amazing part, um, to the fact that they were actually having press conferences together and working together. And that's when they kind of started to decide, OK, we need to maybe take a statewide vote of every county. We were talking and we don't know if, if maybe they thought not every county was that hardcore or if they thought we'd all want to go. I don't know. I, I think that there are several reasons for it. Like I said, we don't have collective bargaining, so it's not like we have a system in place to go on strike, you need this percentage right. or you need to do this. We, we're making this up as we go. You know? <laughs> and they say, well, you need 70%. A really high percentage for some of these places, 70%, and not just union members, 70% of all the employees in your school system, period. But all but a couple of counties reached that threshold. Wow. <laughs> and, and the ones that didn't were still in the 60s. Wow. I mean, mm. the last time there was a strike Change in 1990. that straight away, by the way. Hmm? 30% is enough. Really? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, and it was scary to people to come around, you know, we came around with little ballots, it's like, don't put your name on it, but drop it in here and vote, you know, and um, I, I remember how afraid people were, because they're telling us they can, you can, they can file an injunction against you, you could be arrested, you could be fined, um, but, you know, you just have to keep reminding people, if we all do it, they can't do that. They can't. Now, as things progressed, um, they had their Fed Up Friday, and then after that, AFT and WVEA and WVSSPA called a rally at the Capitol. And was that, what day was that? Was that a Thursday? No. It was a Saturday. It was on a Saturday, and they said the following week, on the Thursday, Friday next week, that we would be out. Statewide. Everyone. All schools. And, um, People were excited and terrified. You know, I don't know if people actually thought it would happen. Um, but it progressed from there. And the first several days at the Capitol, like, they kind of tolerated us. But I still think that the legislators didn't take it seriously. Like, they really thought it was going to break quickly. They didn't think that we had support from parents and families. They just didn't think we could do it. Um, but they got nastier and nastier, and social media got nastier and nastier. I mean, they just started looking awful in the public eye, I think. I mean, really, they shot themselves in the foot. If they had just been quiet, it would have been better. Um, and then later on, oh, well, and you saw, I forgot to mention that. One of the things that we did um, that's different than, I guess, the typical strike is a lot of the counties continued to um, participate in coaching and sports programs and a lot of these extra things that couldn't be made up necessarily the way that a school day could in the summer. So we tried to make it very clear that we did not want to in any way hurt the students or punish them or make them miss out on opportunities. And there was a lot of disagreement about that. Some people thought, well, you're not doing this right. <laughs> this is not how you go on strike. Um, 
we tried to organize food drives and make sure that everyone was fed because like I said earlier a lot of kids go to school to eat mm -hmm. and so we had to make sure that that happened um, and that was successful and we got media attention for that and that mm -hmm. was good I do feel like it took a little while to get some national media attention up at the Capitol mm -hmm. I kept thinking where are they why aren't they here yeah. watching this we need we need this to happen so that the legislators know it's not just West Virginians watching them and um, you wanted to well, jump in. Finally, on the fourth day of the strike, we had, you know, NBC, one of our national news channels, was going to come do like a live broadcast outside, um, kind of from the steps outside that evening. So there was a, you know, okay, let's all get, let's get as many teachers as we can and service personnel out there so it looks like a huge showing for it and everything. And, and while that's happening, the governor has called our union leaders into a meeting, which is the first time we've kind of seen anything like this. And they're in there for hours um, before that. And they just happen to end that meeting while we're all on the steps waiting for the live you know, news thing to start. And so, of course, everybody has a cell phone. So we're all already seeing, like, well, OK, what are they saying? What are they saying? Oh, he agreed to a 5% raise, <laughs> a task force for our insurance. You know, everybody's kind of like, hmm, in a couple of So people have some time to think about these things. And they kind of do the live broadcast. And then our union leaders come out and announce it you know, you've got a 5% raise, we came to this agreement, tomorrow's a cooling off day, you'll all go back on Thursday. They've got a task force to fix your insurance, <laughs> um, and a few other things, and it was, to me that was the most amazing moment of the strike. Not, not because people started booing the union leaders, although that, <laughs> that did happen, but people, and people started yelling out, you know, we are the union bosses, and go back to the table, and all this, but the coolest part was is you had these people that for years had kind of been complacent and not really active and not super involved um, that suddenly through four days of strike had seen their collective power and realized where the power lied and suddenly were like kind of just like nope that's not exactly what we want so we'll probably be back out here on Thursday you know, you say go back and it it was just amazing. So that, that next day that's supposed to be the cooling off day, at least in my county, I think a lot of counties, we're scrambling to have county level meetings and it's basically people are kind of saying, look, we voted to walk out, but you just kind of handed us an agreement that we had no say in. We want to have a say in it. And so I know in my county we said, we basically took a vote then and said, we're not going back in until all this stuff hap that they've talked about happens and is actually signed into law because we don't believe that they're actually going to do it. And with the reason, because it was like nine years prior, they had put into legislative code that they would attempt to raise teacher salaries by $10,000 over the next 10 years. They raised it exactly $0 in that time. <laughs> yeah. So trusting yeah, that you're no going to try to, yeah, there right. was no trust. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's when it kind of went wildcat because before it had been kind of state level like closing of all the 55 counties, but it, that was that Wednesday was the day when county by county, basically the county union leadership, which was not staff, just teachers, were calling the superintendents and saying, "I know they said we're supposed to go back to school tomorrow, but we're not." So you might want to go ahead and cancel because in this county we're not. And I remember staying up that night. And we had like a, it's, you know, it's the shape of West Virginia now, kind of like Hershey with the counties. Um, and they would go red when it was showing that they weren't having school the really? next day. Oh. And I remember staying up, and it wasn't until maybe 10, 30, or 11 that all 55 again wow. were red. And we were, yeah, we were all <laughs> And so oh, that's yeah. when it really kind of kicked into high gear, and no one, you know, was really sure what was going to happen. Um, I let you talk about, but our superintendents who, and we don't really have that here, but they're kind of the boss of the county level school kind of came to our side. Traditionally, so. locally, not the favorite person yeah. of the teachers not and service thought. personnel, usually the enemy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of them, I think, remember the 1990 strike or understood some of the implications and they close school every day. 
They did not want to try and have school and see who would show up. They didn't want a picket line in that sense in front of their school. And, you know, they've been struggling with cut budget cuts also. Um, they can't fill their positions. How are you supposed to improve your schools with kids coming with more and more needs? You can't fill your positions. You can't pay your people. You just you can't go anywhere. So they were pretty upset, too. So, um, but several days in, they decide that they're going to, a few of them go down there to meet Mitch Carmichael and, and see what's going on for themselves. He's our Senate president who's holding everything up. We had agreements with everybody else and he's holding it up. He became the enemy. He was the yeah. figure of that. <laughs> and, um, but so they go down there and they set up this meeting for the next day. And then they go back to their counties and they contact, I guess, the other superintendents and the majority, the vast majority of the superintendents came the next day to this meeting. Well, mm -hmm. they come, they wait for hours and hours. He puts them off, he puts them off, he sends out his secretary and says, you know, meeting's canceled or we're not gonna have time. And they're like, we're not leaving by this point because they've seen how bad it is for themselves. Well, then they have a meeting and they just give him hell. I mean, and he tries over and over to make it a choice. He said, well, we can fix PEI or we can do this pay raise, this or that. And, you know, they explained their position and what they need for their employees. And they really advocated for us, for which I am incredibly appreciative. We didn't know it was going to happen and we didn't expect it. Um, but they continued to call off school. And meanwhile, you have our attorneys general, Patrick Morrissey, kind of flitting around trying to find a weak link in that trying to find a superintendent that will be willing to file an injunction and force the employees to go back. And they stood 55 United also. Wow. So that was amazing. Yeah. It made it a lot easier. And by this point too, I mean, it's becoming a circus. Yeah, I mean, it's true. We're starting to get national attention mm -hmm. and one of our chants became the whole world is watching mm -hmm. outside their chambers and it was true. Yeah. So they accidentally passed our 5% pay raise bill. <laughs> <laughs> they accidentally passed the wrong bill. I'm not kidding. The bill that they, <laughs> and then they tried to take it back. <laughs> and all of this is being reported nationally and everybody's so confused. It's like, did this actually happen? What is going on? Um, but it started falling apart for them. Um, they tried to break us, but because of their behavior, they made themselves look like such fools. They eventually, I think, just gave in. Yeah. So we ended up getting 5% not only for teachers and school personnel, but for all public employees wow. in West Virginia. Yeah. And we have a long way to go. I mean, we are nowhere near where we need to be, but just to have a victory, you know, is amazing. And, and I think it gives people hope and it gives people courage and I think people are more confident in themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, people that have not been engaged know who their legislators are and aren't afraid to go knock on their door and go talk to them repeatedly if necessary. Um, so I'm very proud. Well, yeah, and West Virginia is, is seriously really not known for anything positive. Usually, <laughs> like, like the most obese state, got the worst like part of the opioid crisis. Like, seriously, it's, it's like hillbilly, all those kind of stereotypes. And so now people are even using like West Virginia as a vert, like don't make me go West Virginia on you. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it could, and then we would have never thought, I mean seriously, we never thought about like this kicking off in other states, but quickly Oklahoma, Kentucky, Arizona, like North Carolina, like all these places. And part of that shows you how bad education funding is across the country. But it was really inspiring for us and really positive, I think, for all of West Virginia to feel good about something, you know, something positive. Coming so out those teachers across the rest of the states, they're reaching out to you for advice. What, what do you say in those circumstances? To I mean, I think the first thing we say, and this is what we would tell you too, is like, seriously, if we can do it, anybody can. <laughs> because like, we did not know what we were doing. First of all, you can see that we were not like some really strong union state or something. Yeah. Um, but get people communicating and working together and, and you can make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just whatever you do, do it together. Yeah. You know, I would not say that 
people in the unions do not agree on everything. It's not as if we all believe a certain way. And so you really had to put aside a lot of social issues and a lot of other national level issues and just focus on they're distracting us while they're robbing us. That yep. is what is happening. Mm -hmm. And people really had, we just, we made them really mad. That's what we did. I mean, we seriously, just we kept, got people really, really mad. And kept and reminding them like, to where they could not forget. Yeah. And once you see how angry everybody else is, I think it does feed into that. And, and it's valid anger, you know? It's something they should have been angry about a long time ago. It was just time. Yeah. Is it okay if I open it up for a question? Please. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, anyone who wants to speak, just raise your hand and I'll take a list. Um, please. Um, so you mentioned it spread out to several other count, um, states or counties. Uh, can you say a bit more about, because I know that's been a bit more mixed in, in terms of success and stuff. Could you say a bit more about this? The problems in the different states, some of them are similar and some of them are different. And, you know, like I know in Kentucky, because we were in Mingo County, we kind of had some teachers that would be back and forth. And if you worked in Kentucky, you made more money, a good bit more. But your benefits were a lot worse. Your retirement and pension was worse. And they did not have union strength at all. But they have been robbing the Kentucky teachers' pensions for years. And I think us being right next door really brought them... Um, forward into being active. And you were speaking a lot more with the Oklahoma and Arizona people, right? Yeah, I think one thing that maybe shouldn't be forgotten about West Virginia is that, A, we actually had a teacher strike in 1990. It, it wasn't as big, but it was successful in that it brought about a raise and a change. So people remember that, but also West Virginia has all the coal heritage. And mm -hmm. if you say the word strike, people know what that means mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. Where I'm not sure in Oklahoma and Arizona they had such a labor history, so they kind of had to learn more about that. They also weren't as strong, um, the unions weren't as strong there, so I don't think they really had that kind of base to organize around and draw from. At least in each county, one of our two unions usually was mm -hmm. at least there and had some people and could kind of coordinate. So. Oklahoma was a bit mixed just because of, I think because of us and the threat of walking out, they eventually did walk out, they did get a large raise. Um, Arizona, similar, they, they had to walk out there, they were much better organized than even we were. Well, and that brings that up, so I had a couple of people contact me from Virginia offering assistance, but also letting us know they didn't have to strike, they didn't have to go anywhere near that. All they had to do was threaten and say, we're going to do this, this, and this, wow. like West Virginia, and we're able to get Suddenly like a $1,000 right raise or something just with yeah, that. That's what you want. Mm -hmm. um, you talked earlier about um, thresholds for striking, and, um, you know, I quipped in with 30%, you know, but actually, uh, at the moment, you have won a strike and so now is the time not to expect them to tell you but for you as the union to tell them what you think is acceptable you know in the future you know because 75 percent frankly is ridiculous you know they don't get 75 percent in order to stand in in, in the legis legislature you know what do they get 35 25 percent you know or make those kinds of figures your figures for taking industrial action to support you know, to support your members, you know, and start from there and see where it goes, rather than accepting the seventy five percent. Right. Well, and they called it a super majority. I think it was seventy percent, but not much difference. <laughs> but um, I don't know. And he said that earlier. I don't know what exactly the strategy was for. for picking that number. Mm. But I think part of it too was sort of almost to use it as intimidation to say we have this many people, this large a percentage, even if 20% of them drop off or change their mind, you know, you still yeah. have a massive number. So yeah. in that sense, you know, I don't have a problem with it. But in reality, I, I don't know what percentage the superintendents and local people are sitting there thinking, what can we get by with? But you don't need even that many if all your bus drivers go out yep. yeah. in yeah. West Virginia. Yep. You yeah. don't need a fraction of that. Mm -hmm. Was that a threshold that, is, that the superintendents were imposing? 
The 70? No, they had nothing to do with that percentage. Was it a union? It was a union. And from what I understand, that was agreed upon between the unions. Uh, okay, sorry, I thought it was a legal requirement. No. 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 So if they did, it was totally unlawful. Right, it was <laughs> yeah. just making it so, up. Yeah. So I have, the, I have the speaker with the glasses. Go ahead. Um, thanks, Tamara. Um, my name's George. I used to be Unison branch secretary in this borough, Camden. Questions, first of all, and then an observation about West Virginia. Have you been able to build upon or at least maintain links with the support staff, the bus drivers, the school meal operatives, etc., who are obviously a crucial part of the success of, of your fight. And secondly, could you update us about what's happening with this insurance scheme, the PEIA, which I gather affects about one in every seven mm -hmm. residents in the state of West Virginia quite directly. Uh, and I, I gather this task force is not thus far delivering anything like what you were hoping for. And then an observation. As many of you may know, West Virginia in the 2016 presidential election voted very heavily in favor of Trump. I think 62% of those who voted voted for Trump. And I suspect that's partly a reflection of the influence of fundamentalist Christian churches among sections of the electorate. But it's also worth noting, and I think that is indicative of incredible tension in U.S. politics, that in the Democratic Party primaries earlier that year, Bernie Sanders actually won the vote in all 55 yep. counties, which I think in a strange way might have been a harbinger of what was to come in the late winter, early spring of, of 2018. I think that kind of tension is being reflected in many states across the U.S. Uh, I gather you're going to County Durham on Friday, so you won't mm -hmm. be able to make it onto the mobilization against uh, Trump. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that whatever differences you might have on social issues are probably very much united <laughs> in this question. But it's also worth noting that Justice, Jim Justice, the governor of West Virginia, has sort of crossed party lines a couple of times. He's a multi-billionaire, as I understand it, and a huge Trump supporter. Yep. He owes the state a lot of money, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, the whole issue of taxation and cuts, which you hinted at um, in, in your introduction, is something we've seen here, obviously, tax cuts for the rich, significant reductions in corporation tax that started, actually, long before the austerity regime, but continued under George Osborne, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer now. So the, a lot of this is not that unfamiliar to people living in Britain. But I think it's, it's worth people here knowing that there is a resistance in the US that includes sections of workers, particularly, but not just in the public sector, as workers as well, not just going on, on Saturday demos. Right. Right. Thanks. They're very, very welcome. Yeah. Um, I was just you had asked about Trump, right? Or, or yeah. just the... Con well, I just... I, I don't think it was just because of fundamental Christians. I mean, I, I believe, and I don't, I'm not saying it was the right choice, but I think people felt very disenfranchised by both parties. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, would, I remember in 2016, temporarily I, I took a leave and I worked as a rep for several months, sort of help, helping to build up our AFT service personnel union. And that would come up because AFT endorsed or was supporting Hillary Clinton and then later that summer did endorse her. And I was unhappy about that. And um, I remember going to that national meeting in Minnesota and them saying, well, we did a poll of our members across the US and that's how it came out. And I talked to everybody I knew and didn't know anyone that had been polled. Mm -hmm. But then they even said, well, and we didn't really even have to do that. And that really bothered me. So I thought, yes, we have voted you in and elected you to make decisions on our behalf, but that doesn't mean we don't want you to check in and see what we actually want, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> um, but when I went around talking to a lot of the service personnel, they would talk about how much they disliked Hillary Clinton. And um, 
I wasn't a huge fan. I didn't want, I wanted Bernie Sanders. But um, when they would talk about Hillary Clinton, I could say, well, I don't really like that person either. Mm -hmm. And they'd talk about Trump, and I'd be like, well, have you heard about Bernie Sanders? <laughs> you know? And talk about what he wanted, and they would nod their head. When you talk about the things that he wanted to achieve yeah. for people, it's hard to argue yeah. with those. Like, who says that's a bad thing, you know? So I feel like that has to be some of the strategy, too, is not focusing on the person anymore, the individual, because... You know, West Virginia was controlled by Democrats for many, many years, and they made many mistakes too. You know, so directing people and letting them see for themselves. Don't just say, that's a Republican, don't vote for them, that's a Democrat, don't vote for them. Say, look at this person, here's how they voted on this issue. And I think directly. Trump and the strike are almost two sides of the same coin in that it's like desperation. People just. And you kind of heard her intro about the state. People were just so desperate there. And Trump said, mm -hmm. you know, hey, uh, bring coal jobs back, all this stuff. And I think a lot of people even probably thought it's not true, but he's at least talking about them yeah. in their community and stuff. And so they, you know, that happened. Um, getting back to a couple of other questions you asked, um, with service personnel, I know personally I would like to be in better contact with them. So yes, we're trying, but... Some of the strange things about a school, right, is some of the people you just literally do not see because of your schedule. Like my bus drivers, I don't know them at my school at all because I have to be inside teaching when they're driving. For me too, that's the hardest group to stay in touch with, and yet they affect so everything yeah. so much. And I think it's something we'd like to do is try to kind of reach out more and stay in contact. And then the, the task force is, is interesting because they, that's gotten up and going now, and they've had... Um, public hearings all over the state, and basically they want to hear from public employees, what are your real problems with our insurance, and what are your proposals to fix it? And the most, the interesting thing to me is that by far the number one solution people have given to fund PEIA is raise the severance tax on natural gas, which in West Virginia we have a large deposit of shale natural gas. Um, they're saying it's going to be the next big industry there and all those things. And yes, while fracking all those things are, are terrible, people are saying, well, look, if they're going to be taking it from us anyway in these out-of-state corporations, we should, they should be paying mm -hmm. more. And it was kind of a really interesting thing to come out of the strike because, again, a lot of the people are Trump supporters, and yet they're saying, like, yeah, tax the corporations, even that. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, even though that's the number one demand already, we've had people on our task force who, by the way, take in a lot of campaign contributions from these natural gas companies mm -hmm. saying, you know, we can't do that. The, the natural gas severance tax, it's too volatile. It, you know, it swings up and down every year. You need something better than that, for your thing, which I know means like raising the food tax or something really regressive that's going to hurt poor people. So that's a fight we're still in. Um, yeah. <laughs> and we have to back up what we said as far as remembering in November. Um, one thing we are doing too is, is actually having teachers enter the races. We have a lot of teachers running for office. I ended up being one of them. I didn't say no fast enough. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but we have to get people in there that actually care about the issues of working people. If we can't do that, they're going to come after us in the spring. It's mm -hmm. going to be bad. Mm -hmm. um, before I call them the next um, speaker, I just want to let people know that we're at crunch time before the game, and I <laughs> don't want to be the Canadian in the room that prevented you from watching this, so um, I'm mean, just be quick with your comments so that um, our, so that Jay and Sarah can respond, uh, and then we'll see how much time we have. Um, I have you next. Oh, okay, great. Here. Oh, hiya. Um, just to say, we were, some of us were uh, Labor Notes in Chicago, so we... Oh, yeah! Um, <laughs> and uh, it was, you know, fantastic. But um, I, I'm sorry if I missed this, because I had to come in late, but you talked about, obviously, that Facebook has been key, but how did you translate that kind of online connectivity to, you know, on-the-ground uh, actions and getting people to actually kind of connect in real life, and how did, it, how did you engage the community? I mean, you said a bit about that, but is there any, any specific thing that you did that you thought were really successful? I mean... Things kind of, like online would build on on the ground things and back and forth. So one, one example I remember, for instance, somebody decided in front of a, a big college basketball game there that they would do kind of an informational picket when the stuff was kind of heating up about it. 
someone in my county saw it, post photos posted online and thought, Man, that's a good idea. So they did one out in front of this huge shopping center we have in town where people go to. So it's just like ideas would spread like that. And people, I think, saw how easy some of this stuff was to do. And so I don't think they realized it, but a lot of these were kind of like escalation tactics before the strike, but they, it was easy to do. They saw someone else do it. So there we go. Mm -hmm. And the social media aspect cannot be stressed enough. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have that, it wouldn't have been possible. In 1990, they didn't all go on strike at once. They couldn't. They weren't in good enough contact with each other to plan it out that well. I mean, this Facebook allowed things to move so much more quickly, you know, and so many more people who would not have had access to that had access to it. Coming later. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's been fantastic listening to you. People might know that I'm a psychology teacher and, and I'm fascinated about group behaviour and about collective consciousness and the way in which you spread ideas and messages and experiences and behaviour. And I'm also an optimist and I think that, I don't think we're that far away from you. It feels like a million miles away and if anyone works in this country we can't possibly imagine walkouts on the scale that you've, mm -hmm. you've made. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. we have to start imagining it, because it's the imaginary order that allowed yeah. you to turn things into reality. If you don't even think it's possible, you never even can see that it could be done. There's also a really lovely little film I showed to my students about leadership, and it's a very funny film, because it's essentially a, kind of a festival, and this one person gets up on the road and starts going like this, yeah, and doing all this weird dancing, and there's a commentary saying, he looks a bit strange, he's a nut. Um, I have seen, have you seen it. Yeah. And um, what it's about is called the, the first follower. And the first follower is the person that looks at that person and thinks, I'll join in. And all you need is that one person. And then what's fascinating, this is a real live event actually, is within about literally eight minutes, 200 people are dancing. I show it in my psychology lessons, in my sociology lessons. I actually saw it showed by a regional official, um, um, Nick, Nick Childs, I think. To make this point is that how you, that is how you build collective uh, activity and collective movements, and I think it's fascinating because on a very very small scale that's exactly what what happened in the John Rowan when we decided to go on strike and called seven days and everyone's absolutely you know themselves and everyone's saying Are you going to be there? Are you going to be there? Are you and you don't know till you turn up but WhatsApp was really powerful because one of our members created a WhatsApp group and it went from one to 35 in a matter of hours, mm -hmm. and, and now the WhatsApp group has got the GMB in it, and now when we were out today with our cleaners, which we've never had in 17 years of our workplace, and the connections, the human connections you build in those moments are so powerful. Are we the new miners? You see, I think we are. You know, I think we are, because what brought the miners together is that they were, first of all, literally at the, the coal face. And I know they went down together and they lived together and they breathed together and that's why they had this amazing solidarity which is why we always cry when we say films like um, Pride or, or Mate One or whatever. I think we're similar to that. Our, you know, ours is a chalk face, we're a bit isolated in the classroom but we are in an incredibly human community that doesn't exist in many places anymore. You go to a call centre, you go to all these mad places, you don't get children, you don't get grandparents. And, you know, our school, you know, why are we going to fight to the death? I mean, not literally, but metaphorically. <laughs> because our school is worth one of the few schools, and there are still, they're still out there, and Kevin will say, and other, other comrades will say, they're still there, but there aren't many schools left that have a true community. And I think we, that is, we have to cherish that, um, because that is what I think created the, the, that, that moment, that spark. That the social media allows you to realise in real time that other people are doing it, and you trust it, yeah? So when it went red, you thought, actually, that's real. It's not fake news. Yep. <laughs> but um, you also know physically, you live in a geographical space with families and communities, and therefore you could coalesce. And I imagine, Kiri, it was quite a physical thing, I imagine. Did you all turn up to work? I mean, when you did your strikes, where did you go? How did you organise your meetings? Was that's everyone in the union, for example? Right. Um, you know, these are the kind of things I'm interested in. We, ironically, have almost a closed shop in this country. Every teacher is in a union, practically, bar a very small percentage. Is that not true, do you think? It's not I far think off. It's 10, 20% for one of Yeah, so we've got almost like nine, you know, let's say 80%. That's phenomenally high. And yet, we've got a massive problem with engagement. 
and that's a problem with demoralisation, atomization, lack of faith, lack of trust, whatever. Everyone in this room, by the way, desperately wants to solve this problem. From Kevin, who's the General Secretary, to me that's a rep. Mm. We may have different ideas about how we think we can solve it, but we're all united in that. And I think what we'll try and suck out of you, I'm afraid, in a way, is, is how do we do it practically? You know, what can we take from your experience that is relevant to us? The final thing I would say is, are, we haven't got to rock bottom yet, have we, Kevin? We haven't got to the point where people are doing two jobs. It's not a money issue. Money's part of it. it it's actually an atomization to do with the madness of canonization, privatization, the horrible neoliberal agenda. And that's been very negative for us because it's separated and isolated ourselves. But we've learned in our school, you can overcome that very, very quickly. So, you know, that's, that's kind of my sort of free-flowing thoughts on the matter. But, you know, we will be quizzing you to get very practical ideas about how do we win our 5%, because that's our goal as a national union. We have half a million people. We want 5%. We want it in a year. And, you know, we'd love to hear how. Well, I... I let me address a couple of those things. Um, I think that when you decide, and you have decided, because the battle you're fighting is for this, and so did we, that, that children have a fundamental right to a good education, and that there are certain things that have to be in place for that to happen, which is qualified, paid staff, mm -hmm. who can also have a fundamental right to take care of their families. Mm -hmm. right. So that's what we're fighting for. And that's what you're fighting for. And I mean, that, that's a battlefield to die on, you know? You, you can't take education away from somebody. It's that mm -hmm. important. But um, you mentioned by county how it looked in different counties. It looked very different in my county. Actually, my county and his county was probably pretty similar. Even though mine were rural, it's not far from the capital. So when I can say, all right, here's what we need you to do, and in West Virginia, Every conversation is going to take half an hour. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no brief. Let me call you and let you know. It, no. <laughs> so um, there was a lot of time having a lot of heartfelt, emotional conversations over and over with people, and that's just that's the work. That's mm -hmm. how it had to be done. Um, but if you were close to the Capitol, we wanted you at the Capitol. We wanted you in there, we wanted you in their face, we wanted you to gum up the work so much that they could not ignore it. Mm -hmm. And that's simple. Like, I'm not even saying go and be knowledgeable about this issue and the history of this legislative bill and visit all of these people. Just go there. Just go stand in the way somewhere and you'll learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And in other counties, you know, I felt really bad actually for the Panhandle counties, this and this right here, because mm -hmm. They're many hours away. I mean, from here to here, it's, what, five and a half, six hours drive? Yeah, yeah. So you can't be down there every day. Now, they did come down a couple of days. They used buses and got down there. But it's hard because you're so far away from it, and the way the media is portraying it, it's not necessarily exactly what's happening. Right. It would just be absolutely nerve-wracking. I know it was for people out there because they're trying to have their rallies and, and do these things, and they're not quite sure actually of what's happening. So I'm glad I was close to the action, truly, because it seems more stressful that actually at least you're there and can see for yourself what's going on. One other thing that, as you were saying that about like lessons and talking about the film um, that you show, like I think you have to build a certain level of anger. I mean, that has to be there or mm -hmm. something to just kind of leave. But also you really just need that for us it was like Ningo County basically, the first county to basically be like, we're walking out. Mm -hmm. You kind of need that, that first, yeah, yeah, you need that first group that that's just project. is bold enough <laughs> to say like, we're doing it, you know? And I think when other people see that, again, ideally that level of anger is there enough that they think, that, yeah, I like that, that's, yeah, that mm -hmm. feels right. Well, and it's guilt and courage. It gives you the courage, but you also don't want to leave them hanging by themselves. Yeah, you don't want to be. You, you don't want to be that guy. Right. And as far as, this is one thing that I've been thinking about and trying to figure out for years, but how to get people engaged, just like your students, just like you scaffold lessons, just like kids are on all different levels. You know that word. Yeah. You know, we hate that <laughs> word. <laughs> but, yeah. yes, you have to do that for your activists. <laughs> I mean, there are people that want to do something, but they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the skills, or they feel intimidated. 
I mean, some of the things I started doing in my school was I just made a list of all of our local delegates' name, phone number, and said, this is your action today. Call these people and mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. something about this, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. Just like action a day. You know what I mean? Simple, yeah. doable, it takes you 10 or 15 minutes. And then, mm -hmm. you know, your next action might be to come to this local meeting. Your next action is to get to Charleston. You know, yeah. I will drive you. Just meet people where they are if they're willing to do it. You know, don't, you don't want to tell people what to do, but you want to give them something to go on. Yeah. Don't just say, we want you to help, but then not tell them what you need. And encourage the rank and file. Like if they, if a random member comes up with an idea, I feel like sometimes with unions we tend to be like, well, let's think about that. <laughs> Three weeks later, you know, you maybe get back to them. Instead, just like, that's great, yeah. let's do it. Yeah. Like, yeah. just support their initiatives and they'll feel empowered to take more leadership. With any, anything else with leadership. I mean, it's the same lesson. Yeah. It's no different. If somebody wants to do something, they will be empowered to do it. Give them whatever resources you can to, to help them. Yeah. And they'll own it. Um, just, no, I, what I'm going to say is that I, I actually think this conversation is more important than the football. So <laughs> I'm going to carry this conversation on. And if you would like to see the beginning of the game, then um, maybe just do it on your phone is what I'm going to say until <laughs> we, I don't know if that's disrespectful um, to the football lovers, but it, I just think we have a couple more speakers and it's close to seven, but I want to get the others. I want to get those on the floor to be able to speak. Is it actually starting next door? Where they're going to show you. I think that's where they're Okay, so you can go, yeah, you can go next door, um, but I am going to go past seven. Um, <laughs> yeah. Shame. This is um, yeah. So I have the speaker at the back of the Palestine. Um, thanks. Uh, just uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, sort of following on from some of the things that Kiri said as well around the involvement of the wider community and how you kept your parents and carers involved in supporting the the, the actions and campaigns you were taking and. Um, the, the role of school boards and getting people into all those school board meetings because I've been watching stuff on social media about massive attendances mm -hmm. at school board meetings with people filling up schools and corridors and coming in and doing their like two minute speeches and then having to get off the bottom and just seeing and then wondering how we don't have those but if we hear about how the community's got involved in those whether we can translate that to any of our forms of democracy and community democracy and, and think about how we can get our parents and carers involved in that level of democracy? I will say, that's kind of a hard question to answer. Oh, <laughs> well, that part of our system, I mean, most school boards only meet once a month, maybe twice a month. And they were... I felt like that was kind of detached, didn't you? I mean, some of the school boards came out and actually wrote a letter of support, which shocked some of us. Other county school boards were kind of, you know, um, I don't really know how they were feeling about it. I've seen activism at the local, and that's more the local level than the state level. Um, I mean, I think with parent community, though, I think sometimes we don't realize like how important teachers are in the local community. Um, and I think sometimes we worry like, oh, how am I gonna make the parent, you know, how do I make more contacts with the local community, make sure we have support. I think a lot of times, especially in smaller towns and stuff, they wanna support you because they you've been a member of the community. You you've helped like raise their kids, like they know. And so one useful thing we did do, um, was they called them walk-ins, which is like an informational picket kind of before school. And I think it really helped kind of alert the community to like, wow, okay, like, wow, these teachers that I know, because they've taught my kids, like, mm -hmm. their health insurance is really about to be that bad, mm -hmm. and stuff, and kind of woke them up, and of course they want to support you, you know? Well, and when you remind those parents that it's not just the teachers, but it's their police officers and their social workers and their firefighters and they're all these other people that are so essential, they really did care. 
And we had parents come out to pickets. Yeah. We had children a come. Lot. I didn't mention this, that the, a lot of students in West Virginia had um, a student rally at the Capitol. They and did. they it was really cool. completely encircled the Capitol and marched around it. Like, it was really inspiring. It was really, really cool. Yeah. Um, I've still, I think I've got a little bit of video and stuff on my phone still from that, but um, parents, I mean, we have parents at my school that will bend over backwards to try and do things to help the school. You know, even though we don't have a lot of money, we have older buildings, especially in rural West Virginia, the school is the community center. There aren't other places. Mm -hmm. yeah. That is where everything happens. It would be nice to, to continue building on those relationships, yeah, though, and keep creating sure. more. And actually, we were talking earlier about some ideas for that. Like, we have something that's really underutilized called LSIC, Local School Improvement Council. And it's one of these things that has a lot of power, but nobody wants to do it. <laughs> it's, it's something you have to do, but it's... Um, a group made up, each school should have one, and it has some staff members, it has local community business leaders, um, it'll have some parents from the school, and they make recommendations to the school and to the school board as to what that school needs. And if you could harness that kind of, those kind of groups to make, and take those recommendations higher, not just to local, but send those on to the state, I bet you're gonna see a lot of common themes. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and that might be a way to engage um, parents. It's something to look at, too. I'm the General Secretary of the Union here. Uh, I just wanna thank you for being there. I think it's really good that you're here, and Kirsty and the others who, uh, who organized it. And it seems to me that you're just really what you did is really inspirational. Mm -hmm. That there was something that's a trigger. You can't do these things in the abstract, but the sure. attack on the, the insurance. But then your ideas of reaching out to people and getting people to organize and celebrating what they're doing, and that proves that teachers can <coughs> act. You compelled the unions to act together. You've got parental support. And once you've done that, you've then got the supervisor's support. So it's incredibly inspirational that that's possible to do. And the question we all have to look at is how can we, how can we do that ourselves? And we've got to take, I mean, and the situations can never be exactly the same. We haven't got a threat to our insurance, so it's, it's going to be a different trigger that works for us. But for all of us, the question is what do we do to, to build up that sense of teacher activity? And... And I, I don't know, there's, there has to be something, though, the trigger has to be something that people really feel inside them is outrageous, something yeah. that is making them angry. And you can't decide that for people. It's, right. it's, it either makes them angry or it doesn't. You can't make them angry about something. But I think there is, that it might be that something is about to happen in mm -hmm. our country that will make people very angry. The, the minister concerned is sitting on our pay award for September. We don't know, we know that an independent body has recommended a pay award. We don't know what it is. He's sitting on it. We th I mean, and it may be that there's gonna be a pay award and then they're gonna, not gonna give the schools the money to pay it. And I think that will make people really angry if, if, this, if the rumor that we hear a 3.5% pay rise and not fund it, I think that should make people how can we do that? We'll have to cut loads of staff to do that. It's completely outrageous that you say this thing and not the other. And in that circumstance, I think we need a grassroots mm -hmm. feeling of anger. And yeah. the union has to say things from the top level, but you need to get that. I mean, not least, we need to try and persuade NASUWT members that they should be angry. Not to try and persuade the NASUWT, but that it's not just in one youth, that we're all angry about it. And to find ways to put that out. But I think you show that it's doable. And therefore, it's something we should be trying to do, thinking how we do it. Oh, and uh, you were at Labour Notes, and Kerry's written this report about Labour Notes oh, for our super. executive. So yeah. I thought we'd just send them around. <laughs> we, we've been sending people from head office, from the executive. But it could be that we could get it from associations to go to the Labour Notes conference as well. Um, yes, I have, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, 
it, it can also teach you, it takes a few mistakes. She's like, like the east of area Lincoln, she probably don't know you probably heard of Lincoln. Anyway, the question I was in earlier when you said, right, you've got the service, service, I'm thinking of uh, Abraham Lincoln, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the service section is to get people to work together in unity. And as Kevin was saying, our general secretary, that the fact that we've got different unions, and when you, what you said, use that thing that you bring the service people, people who are so fully past it, to bring them together. One point I said, you think that that was the central point? And as I've got Hank here, I've just bumped into a website, didn't realize earlier, he was one of the leading people to try to bring the union together. I think that was a, you know, a significant factor in your success. And, and I'll pass on to Hank, because I'm sure Hank can... Like you say, I thought, it started, I thought it started at 6.30. Nobody told me it didn't. So <laughs> I walked down there thinking, well, what are they going to do about the football? You know, I'm going to have to give my apologies and leave early. And they were sat there looking at the football. I said, well, I've missed it all. They said, no, it's still going on. So please, I've heard all this stuff. But I have to say, I've read a bit. But it's brilliant anyhow, anywhere, to hear some other people having a struggle. Oh. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I thought it was a car. No. <laughs> I thought it was a There is massive support for yes. what you've done. Absolutely. All be going backwards for years and years and years, and hopefully this is a start of taking them on. Yes. The glasses we're coming for them. Yes. <laughs> So you were talking about, I can't quite yeah. remember what the acronym is for your insurance, which is your health insurance. P-E-I-A. And that there's this uh, investigatory body going on, and it's, what if this doesn't pan out? I Do expect you, it won't. Right. Do you, will you be back on strike? Do you think that, you could, that momentum will happen, or do you think that the timing, that the stretching out of this investigation, which is generally what they are, is a calling off and demobilizing? I know I, it is all those things. I'm sure that they are using that to cool us off and slow down momentum. But from the other side of it, we understand that they, if they were actually going to fix it, they would need some time to work on some things. So we had to go back. You can't stay out for no. months. Um, and we had to be reasonable, or at least appear to be reasonable, and say that we're giving you this time, you know? Now, when they come back and, and say we won't do any of these things or can't show us that they've even tried, then, yeah, I hope it does anger people again, and they will try and push it off until after the election. I guarantee. Like, none of this is a secret to anyone, I don't think. And in the meantime, they'll try and split us again. They will try to claim credit that's already happening. The Republicans and Mitch okay. Carmichael are claiming credit for the teachers' race and saying... Making, trying to make it rewrite history and make it appear that they were the ones that did this for us. And I think it's all about kind of what we're doing right now and building up on our side. And I mean, yeah, they're trying to draw it out. They're trying to make it a problem. But I mean, look, there's a lot of positives. Like, look, we're here talking to amazing people in the UK and getting new ideas and learning things and there's a lot of other West Virginia teachers who have done this in the meantime and you know so thinking about how we present it the biggest issue I think would be the community support again I'm not sure the parents are going to be like cool like we're canceling school yeah. again so that's that's going to be where it is I hope that it does translate into anger to get get voters out it we have to do that um, and if if we can come back and say look they still don't have anything about PEIA. Do you really want to keep these same people in here? You need to vote. You need to get your kids out voting, your grandparents, your cousins, and your friends. Everyone has to get out and vote and get these people out. They are nervous because we had, our, you know, we have primaries before the real election, and the primary was in May, and pretty much the, the state senator who was the most anti-teacher, the most vocal, the one who was even saying before it, like, the strike was like a bump in the road. It's not going to be anything. He got booted out in the primary by a large yes. margin. Yeah, so they are, they are nervous now, for sure. Yeah, go ahead. 
just curious, what you said that you're going to get involved, you're going to run for a uh, position. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, what, do you align to a party or are you running as a party? I'm running as a Democrat. Um, I'm not completely happy with everything that's been done by that party in, in yeah. West Virginia, but um, I do feel like it most closely aligns with uh, I'm what an, I I'm, an, I'm in the Labour than. Party, so I can't, I'm, <laughs> I can't throw any mud. You know? yeah. <laughs> um, there, there is a group that has been worse to us this past year. so, um, and, and I've been a Democrat for, for a while. I'd like to see things a little more progressive. Um, that's slow coming, I think, in West Virginia. But I'll be running for House of Delegates, 11th District. Thank you. Tim. I was thinking about this issue that Kevin just raised and the, the, you know, the spark that gets people angry. And one of the things that's, that's sort of being discussed in our union meetings at the minute is the issue of pensions. And one of the things that people are worried about, and we haven't got to the bottom of it yet because we already heard it the other week, you know, and that is that pension funds are not being topped up. You know, this, this idea that Greenwich hasn't paid pensions for two years, for example. You know, there's also examples people are discussing about uh, academies not paying into, in, into the pensions, into the teachers' pension scheme. You know, and sooner or later, that... You know, if, if that's the case, then that's going to cause a huge, huge problem. You know, if that's replicated right across the country, you know, and I don't know exactly what the problem is. You, you know, I'm just saying what people have said to me, you know. But if that really is a problem, then that is something that will horrify people to think, mm. you know, that their pensions, that the, the possibility of getting to the end of their careers and not being able to access a pension because the government has taken it away or, or, or the... You know, or the school is saying because it's a business. Well, I don't have to pay it anymore. You know, what is going to happen there? We don't know. So I'm just booting that out there. You know, just because it's something I've heard and I have to investigate. So it's worthwhile looking elsewhere as well. So as, as well as the moment of anger, there is something about the period and the fact that y your uh, state voted for Trump and. Also, in the things voted for, in the primaries voted for Sanders, tells you something about the anger that, mm -hmm. that people are looking for another solution. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm originally from South Wales, which is a coal mining area with the mines closed, and there is a parallel in that Corbyn's got a very big support, and they voted mm -hmm. Brexit on a yeah. essentially a yeah. rea a, I think a reactionary basis of voting for Brexit. So I think that's the same. Pe and uh, th so the. There's a general unease with the way things people feel let down by all the politicians, and then you Absolutely. found a lightning rod for it. And clearly, though, it's a lightning rod, and you've got something that's happened, and whether you can put it back together after the delaying tactic, who knows? And so you've got to find another way of driving forward. So I think you're right to be challenging in the electoral arena, as well as trying to spread what you're doing, because if there are more strike movements like yours across the states, that will make it harder for them to pull back. But it, it seems to me important that when you do stand for the Democrats, you have to, there has to be a Sanders Democrat. Yep. It has to be, we're going to change things, or otherwise it will fall back again. Mm. And I, I just, I, so that's, that sounds disgraceful, because that sounds like I'm giving advice to you, and you, you're showing us how to do it. <laughs> but I want to, on the thing, uh, the situation here, I think we're in a similar position around this, the question of the funding of the pay rise. The, the super, mm -hmm. superintendents supporting closing the schools on the strike days because they are in this mm -hmm. contradictory position of trying to manage the situation and not being able to manage it. So they have to choose whether they're going with the, the, cent, with the, the governor or with the teachers and our head teachers are in a similar position and I think they've reached breaking point as well. They are managing down cut after cut and I think a lot of them yeah. are in a place where they are ready to break with that. Mm. So there are some heads who are close yeah. to that breakthrough point. So if we can combine some sort of militancy with some union activity, with head teachers saying 
but we're on the side of the angels. We're can fighting you, for children. Can you go that. to them and say, can, how can we advocate for you also? What do you need for we, your schools? What can yeah. we... Yeah. We, would they be receptive to that? We're, yeah. we're working with the head teachers. I mean, unfortunately, we've got far too many unions in this country. Yeah. So we're, <laughs> we're about 50% of teachers and head teachers. NAS, UWT is another 35, 40%. And then there is a, a, there's a large section in heads unions. We're working well with the heads unions. Unfortunately, not well with the competitor mm -hmm. other teachers. Relationships are very poor with the NAS, UWT at the moment. Mm -hmm. But the heads unions, we think that we are working with them about how we advocate on those questions. So. Yeah, just uh, what I'm thinking is, um, how can we, you know, how can we mobilise um, teachers in this country? Mobilise, um, we call them support staff. I mean, our cleaners, our catering staff, etc. All being absolutely hammered. I think we start with the standpoint that you said, sir, which is something we say, but we really need to say it very, very frequently, which is. And it's something that Tim says to me often, which is that the, the standards in the classroom are the standards of the child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if, you, if, you have it, if you've got poor equipment, demoralised teachers, poorly paid, stressed out people, you've got, you're giving a poor environment to those children. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what's interesting in terms of education is now, this is, you know, education is the new commodity, you know? It's, you sell it to, to working class communities, you sell it to the middle classes, they're all fighting over getting a slice of the cake. I think we have to go back to the basics because what I think is interesting is, you know, what's made people really angry in our, in our campaign is a very simple screenshot. Children who are on low income currently can apply for uniform grant, free school meals and help with school trips. And if it's a local authority school, it's automatic if you, mean, if you meet the means test. It's, a, it's their right. We found the new form that they have to fill in, and there's a paragraph that says, if your child goes to an academy, you cannot apply for this through the local authority. Go back to the academy. Now, this has caused absolute shock and horror. People cannot believe in the 21st century yeah, that children are not going to be given school uniform grants, possibly eventually free school meals or school trips. And we have parents who are out on our picket lines for that alone. And I think it's combining those two things reminding everyone what education's for, empowerment, and self, you know, self and community advancement, reminding people that you can't have that if you don't pay people, we're not a charity, wow. and saying there's nothing wrong with fighting for pay, when did yeah. that become a dirty thing by the right. way? But we have to, I think what we have to learn from you is, yes you fought on funding, yes you fought on the great ideal, but you united over a common aim that everyone could take part in, which is a pay claim. And I think that's the, we need a national dispute. Mm. We've been firefighting on funding, yep. anti-academies, yep. workload. Yep. Mm. And what's been happening is some of us have been standing out and been looking behind, and there's no one bloody there, I'm afraid. I mean, we're the last, I feel like we're the last men standing. I feel like we're bleeding. I don't know, it feels like the OK Corral in the John Lennon, to be honest. <laughs> I think and we, won't, we may not win this gunfight, by the way, OK? Mm. Don't worry, we'll be seeded, and we're going to go all over the country. So we're not going to mm. be defeated. And I think my final comment is, we need a national pay claim, okay? We have a union that can organise it, but we are hampered by these incredible anti-union laws that create thresholds that are very difficult. There are some tactics we have around that. But we are also hampered in a way, no disrespect, Kevin, is that we have very bureaucratic structures. I mean, you have to ask permission for 25 people before you can step out and strike. So we need to be creative, and we need to allow some kind of spontaneous action that, yes, the leaders may have to technically be neutral on, but behind it, say, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you can do it, you can do it. Well, I think you That's the only way I could see a third one. thing earlier when you said something about um, a simple message. I think it's something that we've not been doing very well. We make the issues too complicated. Yeah. It needs to be simple and it needs to be accessible because people in education, we're all bad about it. You know, we, we will talk and talk and talk. <laughs> we will explore every single facet. We will throw yeah. out acronyms and words and all these <laughs> ideas and it, it muddies the water. Mm. You have to keep it simple and you have to make it, you have, it has to be simple and outraging. Yeah. And, with and, your, and direct that. With your bureaucracy thing, I mean, it's. I love the phrase, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So, you know, sometimes you just <laughs> do it and <laughs> see what happens. <laughs>
Well, and on that note, in terms of messaging, like I actually think you guys had a really clear message, and you sang it, which and was we had to do we're it not going to take it, <laughs> and like that is the message that we need to have that we're not going to take this anymore. And how accessible is that? Anyone yeah. can get up there and sing that. Yeah. You don't have to be <laughs> knowledgeable. We we're not going <laughs> to take yeah. it. No. <laughs> we ain't gonna take it. Yeah. We should we should finish on that tone. Yeah, put us in a good. Um. Place. So yeah, on that note, I mean, I think people should stay and continue to talk to Jay and Sarah because we are just so thrilled that you guys came across the pond, and we're just gonna play a little song for you. Yeah. One more to the camera. Go on. I'm not we're not going to take any more yeah. photos. <laughs> 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 the thing is, when we're on Good. Good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you.